Hello, everyone, and welcome to Journey to Success Radio, a show featuring people and companies who are making a positive contribution to the world. This show will help you learn how to apply success principles in every area of your life so that you can make the most out of your skills and talents and accomplish more of your goals. To find out more about the show, please visit www.journeytosuccessradio.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Journey to Success Radio. My name is Tom Tutal Cunningham. I'm a resiliency expert and Napoleon Hill Foundation certified instructor, helping people to think, speak, and act positively through the many and very challenges of life. I have an exciting guest today that I met in Del Mar, California, at the Think and Grow Rich Summit, some of the coolest, nicest, most uh, purposeful people in the world were there, all with definite purpose and all looking to serve the world. And Michael, how do you pronounce the last name right, Michael? Deloitte. Salwa? Deloitte. Yes. Deloitte. Michael Salwa began drinking and using drugs at the age of 10. And by the age of 24, he was a full blown drug addict and alcoholic. At 24 years old, he was able to escape his addiction and has been clean and sober for 29 years. That's a long time. He was introduced to Napoleon Hill's principles 10 years ago when at the age of 42, he found himself making a midlife career change. Uh, A lot of people know what that's about. Into what was at the time, according to the masses, a horrible real estate market. And many of us uh, thought that as well. Michael credits Napoleon Hill's powerful teaching on faith, auto-suggestion, determination, persistence, and service as the key ingredients that helped him find success and abundance in the San Diego real estate market. He loves working in real estate. It's his purpose. It's his passion. And his passion is studying and sharing the knowledge of Napoleon Hill's principles of success that he has acquired through 10 years of his intense study. Uh, Welcome to the show today, Michael. Thank you so much, Tom. It is an honor to talk to you. I am absolutely blown away. We are Facebook friends, and I'm blown away by your uh, determination, your persistence, and your, I kind of keep up with your workout schedule, so it's an honor to speak. <laughs> it, uh, when you get, I find when you get Napoleon Hill people in a room or talking on the phone, like we could make this show about probably seven hours. Nobody, not a lot of people listen that long, but you develop an instant friendship because even though you may use different portion of the 17 principles or in a different order, you still know about purpose and mastermind and faith. And so once you get people talking about that, uh, we got a lot to share with the audience. So uh, you were born, you were born with club feet. I was born with club feet. I, you know, it's a, it was, I was two years old when they had them operated on. My parents had me operated on at that point. And uh, so I don't remember much about the situation other than I had one picture where it showed me in a waist high cast. And my mom used to tell me I was a terror because obviously if you have a two year old with a waist high cast, you have some uh, work to do as a parent. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it didn't affect me. It it, it didn't affect me because I knew nothing of it. So I went through and I grew up and I was eight and I was nine. I was 10. I was playing baseball. I was doing everything a normal kid would do. My mother did say I was lucky to be able to walk at that time because it was such a new operation that they had performed on me. But like I said, normal childhood up until the age of, you know, eight, nine and 10. And then uh, as kids would do, it started kind of uh, I started kind of being teased about the way I walked. I wouldn't know it. I couldn't see it in myself, but I started mm-hmm. getting teased about it, you know, by other kids. So that started to wear on me a little bit. Uh, from that point on, I started looking for people who would accept me and not tease me. And uh, I found those people. Unfortunately, there were people who also did drugs and drank alcohol and that sort of thing. So I took a turn for the worst at that point in my life. 
you uh, said uh, something that uh, made me smile a lot is that you said you you didn't notice that you limped, but other people seemed to notice. And I don't know if I shared it in San Diego, but one of the funniest things I find is watching myself speak on video because I'm like, wow, I really do limp a lot because I'm thinking in my head like, oh, okay, I have a slight limp. You know, maybe people will notice I have a slight limp. But if I watch it on video, it's like, oh, jeez, I have a limp. And so it's funny for me to hear you say yeah, other people saw it, but no, I didn't see it. And then right. another story that my mom tells, my mom went for it's been 20 plus years to Honduras on medical mission trips. And one of the stories about, you know, in Canada, we have uh, universal health care. So four hips, four knees and two shoulders replaced and it didn't cost me money. Uh, and so in Honduras, she tells me of a boy who had club feet. They don't have that surgery there. His leg, one of his legs was turned all the way around, so the front of his foot faced the back. And even when I tell that story, it just the visual of it is painful to think about. And so we, we are blessed, you're blessed that they were able to do the surgery. Uh, it was new at that time. Uh, we're not young folks, you and I, so <laughs> some of these things are being invented back then. Right, right. And you know what's interesting about your comment is is that now you look at it and and if we relate it to Napoleon Hill's principles, it's like somebody puts that in your mind. See, and the minute, you know, you you talk to people all the time these days, or I do, I talk to people all the time, and they have this vision of themselves. And it's all created by exactly what we're talking about here. Well, I don't know so much about you seeing yourself on video but typically when somebody plants an idea in your mind like hey you're different michael then that is what i carry on and carry on and carry on you know i keep repeating to myself i'm different right. I'm different, I'm different there's a habit developed from that and it's right. very interesting that we're bringing this up and it's touching actually because it's i mean it's very sad to think I mean, nobody made me do drugs and alcohol from 10 to 24, but once at the base of it, once that got inside of me and I started repeating that to myself, uh, I had to do something to, to make it go away is what I felt like, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, this is like the, uh, the basis of Napoleon Hill's work is thoughts are things and it's easy to get distracted to the negative and bad things in life uh, our brain if not purposely focused will lure us into all kinds of things that we should not do and so uh, when you're able to control those 60,000 daily thoughts to a pre-chosen purpose tell me what that does for your life because it changed your life around learning these principles didn't it well, I'll go to your Facebook feed when you're doing your workouts. You know, I play baseball still. I'm 52 years old. I threw 200 pitches on Sunday. And interestingly, what I pay very close attention to in my life is that first thought in the morning. I wake up at five o'clock every morning. I'm a realtor. I don't have to get up at five o'clock every morning, but I have developed the habit of getting up at five o'clock every morning and not every morning when my first thought is not tuned to, especially after playing baseball, it's not tuned to, I feel great. I'm alive. I'm awake and I feel great. So I catch that thought right there and taking that to the gym with me is I need to change whatever's going on. Like my shoulder hurts or something like that. And so when you talk about thoughts or things, uh, valuable, invaluable piece of information that when I really understood, when I really understood what it meant, what it did was it attached a responsibility to me. It attached a value to a thought, and then it attached a responsibility to me to be very, very aware of what thoughts are going through my mind at any given moment. And one really clear specific instance of that was I had started to have a little bit of success in the real estate market. So I had more money. I made 30,000 bucks a year for, you know, raising my kids for 15 years. And then I had gone into the real estate market. I started generating some money. So I had more money than I knew what to do with at this point. 
and I'm sitting in my car at a stop sign. And I tell people this too, to kind of, because it was my point where I saw everything was good in my life, Tom, you know, mm -hmm. everything was good in my life. There was nothing wrong with my life. In fact, I was driving to the gym at the time. And at that stop sign, all of a sudden, a thought came into my mind, did I pay that bill? And it was almost like I shivered from this thought. It was almost like a fear came into my mind. Then something else followed it. Are my kids okay? You know, and it was almost like it was floating through the air and I could actually touch this. And mm. when I had that moment, I saw what I did was I started repeating the word love to myself. At mm. that moment, I understood that I needed to flood my mind bring to the top of the file cabinet, if you will, thoughts that I wanted in my mind and not allow that empty space to be in my mind. Because if I'm not watching it, it's going to be filled with something. And that something is going to be negative if I'm not <laughs> injecting positive into it. Now you're getting me excited. You're talking <laughs> my language. You're talking <laughs> my language. And you have to pre-choose those thoughts because, as you said, hey, people are going to be surprised. Do the most positive guys people that I've probably ever met, you and I, they're like, I think talking about actually having negative thoughts. We're human too, man. You know, traffic annoys me sometimes. Bosses annoy me sometimes. Uh, I'm married, so that acts a cause for annoyance sometimes. But it's when you can immediately recognize and redirect it to your pre-chosen uh, affirmation, auto-suggestion, and the subconscious if you just repeat it often enough, it's going to be like, okay, man, like this guy's serious. Let's go out and do this. You know, this isn't just something he's wishing for. He keeps telling us it. So eventually you meet people and get into situations like, wow, I wonder how that happened. It's because mm -hmm. you said it would happen about 87,000 times before it actually happened. Uh, yeah, yes, totally agree. And, you know, lately I've been, focusing on the word flooding my subconscious mind, you know, flooding my subconscious mind and not allowing any space for the negative show up. And it's interesting um, when you, when you talk about situations that are going to come up, interestingly enough, I'm starting to notice how I affect those situations prior to even going in, depending on what my mind was doing prior to going into those situations. You do. Your thoughts do influence people without a word being said, is my belief. Mm -hmm. That's Napoleon Hill's belief as well. Yep, your thoughts, and that also creates your body language. And, you know, a lot of times you, positive people, I can recognize a positive person, right? So it's like, yeah, yeah, that guy's, you know, he's, and so it reflects your thoughts reflect around you. I think, uh, I think I saw a video recently with some scientific proof that I think within nine feet of you around you, uh, your sure. thoughts, the energy of your thoughts go out. And so auto-suggestion, affirmations, whatever you have to do, uh, you know, I have two or three of them and I can immediately, I don't have to notice the negative thought and then think, okay, what should I think about instead? I just immediately go to one of the three and just turn off whatever I may be listening to, say them out loud, whatever it takes. But that, if 60,000 thoughts, I don't want to waste too many of just like being upset or negative uh, over life's little petty, silly things. And so you must have affirmations, auto-suggestions where, you know, people think you're singing in your car, but you're probably actually telling yourself an affirmation. Ah, well, you know what? Yes. And mixed with passion and feeling. So when it is that, I am a great real estate agent screaming out in my car. Um, you, you can have, I can absolutely feel the difference between, in fact, I coach people over here in real estate and in life and such. Uh, and, and it's interesting because there is so much more to a statement mixed with passion. If you want auto suggestion, you could call affirmation, whatever you want to call it. Um, but it's interesting to see somebody light up and almost their body lift, you know, their body, their shoulders lift. And they, and they almost, when you get that person to actually mix some feeling and emotion into it and start to develop that belief, you know, for me, this was, 
you know, jumping into this real estate market for me, it was every step. I used to go to the gym. I used to run a couple miles. Every step, I would be doing something. Some of those affirmations were, "My name is Michael Salois with this company, and I'm a great real estate agent." With every step of the track, I would take, mm -hmm. you know, and just mm -hmm. like I said, flooding my mind with those thoughts and not allowing. And I'm not saying that they never do get in, but the awareness, right. the awareness yeah. of it, is. Um, and the simplicity of it really is what's so great, I think, Tom. I'm sure you'll agree with it, too. Oh, yeah. Awareness. That's the, that's the most, probably most important thing to controlling your thoughts is awareness. And we all know it. You and I know it. Even we cannot be aware. We could just be driving in our car in traffic and our brain might not even be thinking of a negative thing. It is thinking of nothing. Sure. Uh, you don't, you don't want to be wasting too many thoughts you want to be really letting your subconscious know hey this is what i want uh who was i talking to uh, uh colin gilmartin who i interviewed yesterday was telling about remember when napoleon hill told his subconscious mind he needed a title for think and grow rich and he needed it tomorrow by tomorrow and like he just commanded and we went beyond auto suggestion. It was like auto commanding, and he came up with a, a book title, "Think and Grow Rich." I think at two o'clock in the morning or something like that. So auto suggestion is a valuable use of your sixty thousand daily thoughts. And hey, we got two positive guys telling you that negative thoughts are natural. We have them too. But the quicker you can be aware of them and the more automatic your affirmation where you don't have to think, 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 what am I going to say instead, the better it's going to be for you. And uh, so put down two or three of them and it allows you to uh, focus on something that you desire more than well, what is being annoying you. Sure. And before you move on, Tom, I have a question for you and hopefully you're okay with answering this, but I'm sure there is something, I'm sure there is something for you to get you off your couch, out of your chair and to the gym as often as you go to the gym, especially being in the, you know, I hear oftentimes um, that you're not feeling quite up to snuff and, and I'm sure there's something to that. Would you share what it is that you use to, um, I don't want to say power through it, it, because right. that, I don't think that's what it is, but it's to pull you. What is it that's strong enough that pulls you to do that? Right, exactly. And here's one of the you know keys that people have to look uh, look at is that if you decide that you are going to do something and it is a positive thing and a good thing, one of the 17 principles is maintenance of sound health. But anybody, an able-bodied, you're somewhat old like me. I'm 52, so we'll call ourselves able-bodied for fun. But you know, you're you're fairly uh, able-bodied, uh, and you still uh, probably don't like going to the gym a lot of time. You're like, huh? I'm tired? Did you see how hard I work today? You know, and you could be selling your brain on excuses. Like, you know, I have arthritis, right? You know, I'm going to be sore, right? You know, I'm already sore, right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's true. Maybe I shouldn't go tonight, but. You know, when you're sore 24-7 every second of the day, you have an excuse all the time. So I had to make a decision that I'm going to go because I set the one how many times a week I'm going to go and I'm going to go and I'm going to consistently go and I'm going to go over a long period of time. And I have to do that by ignoring how I feel at the time. Yes. Uh, because I have I have built in excuses that I could just use every day. Well, I didn't go yesterday because I was sore, and I'm just as sore today. So I think I'm taking today off too. So you have to like really decide if this is uh, part of your purpose, part of the 17 principles of success. You can't just pick and choose two or three of them and say, yeah, I like those ones, but yeah, going the extra mile, screw that one. I don't want to use that one. How about self discipline? No, no, I don't want that one. You have to put them all together. And so I decided I'm going to work out. And uh, sometimes I don't feel like it before, after, or during. But at least I know I went. But I bet like you have had this where you didn't feel like going the most. And when you went, you had the best workout of all time. Absolutely. So beautifully said, Tom. So beautifully said. Definiteness of purpose. Look, at you. this is why I am so honored to speak to you. 
This is such a rare conversation and nothing will stop you from getting what it is that you want. And that's Napoleon Hill's teachings, exactly. And the only thing getting in the way from getting what we want is you. And you just told me, you just gave me the roadmap for overcoming any obstacles to get what it is that you want. And that's such a beautiful thing. So thank you for right. sharing that. Ignore your emotions. Go with it. Go with what you already decided you were going to do beforehand and just ignore your emotions and you will uh, benefit from it. So many times I think to myself, wow, I'm so glad I came to work out. Like, I feel so good and this is a great workout. And so, yeah, you got to just do what you decide you're going to do. If it fits in with the 17 principles, go for it. Well, let's talk about a, a cool thing that you had suggested as a topic and I smiled so much. Self confidence formula napoleon hill self-confidence formula when i was i started as we talked before we were on the air you and i love law of success and i started with law of success i think that's where the self-confidence formula is and may not be in think and grow rich but when i was like 20 or 21 22 i had that memorized and i hadn't read it for a bunch of years and when i came across it again three or four or five years ago I didn't have it exactly memorized, but boy, those words were very familiar. I know that I have the ability to achieve the object of my definite purpose in life, number one, and then goes through five affirmations. And by the time you're done, it says, I will sign my name to this formula, <laughs> commit it to memory, and repeat it aloud once a day with full faith that it will gradually influence my thoughts and actions so that I will become a self-reliant and successful person. Have you read that one a few times, Michael, I imagine? That is, absolutely, that is my screensaver on my phone as we speak. <laughs> I demand of myself persistent, continuous action toward its attainment, and I here and now promise to render such action. This is my screensaver. Yes, it is in Think and Grow Rich as well. It's a little different in Law of Attraction, actually, which I know is before Think and Grow Rich, but he, right. he changed it a little bit in that. But yes, yes. And interestingly enough, the more I study and try to memorize the self-confidence formula, I keep it very handy. So it's not hard to uh, look at and continue to work on memorization of it. But the more right. I have it, the more I realize where not being confident in, in any aspect of my life leads to drifting, leads to lack of definite purpose, leads to many different things. So it makes me fully aware of how important this self-confidence formula is and that really any any lack of success can be attributed to directly to lack of self-confidence in my life yeah amazing the second point we'll just tease people along with uh, some of these points i realize that dominating thoughts of my mind will eventually reproduce themselves in outward physical action and gradually transform themselves into physical reality and this is all what we're talking about here man yes yes and you know what's interesting about this tom is that i've gone through a couple book studies with uh, a couple different groups and i coach people on some of these too and what's interesting about it is this i like to I like to label as the wax on, wax on part of Napoleon Hill's uh, teachings, because here's, here's why I say that. Because these are items where you run into, many times you run into um, kind of hesitation when trying to get somebody to understand how important it is. These are the, you, I'm sure you remember the karate kid and the wax on, wax off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he, it had nothing to do with karate, okay? It really had nothing to do with karate. And how can memorizing these words on this book have anything to do with success? You know, it's very hard to put the two together. But most people, myself included for a long time, would not do the instructions given in Think and Grow Rich, and therefore I would not get the benefit from it because it seems like, hey, yeah, it's okay, I but I already got this. You know what I mean? I've read it. I know what it I know what it says right there. 
But really what it tells you to do is study this, read this every night. I think I, I'm got to go back and look at it, but it, it's like every night until you have it memorized, until you can shut your eyes and memorize this. And, and it's, you know, I don't know what you do to convince people how important those little details are. Michael Jordan shooting baskets in the gym at the free throw line are the important details, you know, Tiger Woods out in the practice course putting are the important details and for napoleon hill's um principles there are so many little instructions in this book that are the details they are the meat they are where you find what the secret is you agree with this tom exactly yeah keep going keep going <laughs> well yeah. i yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, simply, it's 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 an interesting study because people are very quick to. You know what I call Napoleon Hill? I'm going to jump over here for a minute. The yeah, absolute, yeah. the absolute, absolute alibi killer. You can no longer once you start to really grasp these principles, you got nobody left to blame, Tom. You, got, right. you agree with this? You got yeah. yourself and that is it. And anytime you find yourself blaming another situation or anything else for something you don't have or something you don't feel yeah. or whatever it is, you got Napoleon Hill gets rid of all of that. You know, you go to the back of Think and Grow Rich and the 50, the 50 uh, alibis, right? Right. <laughs> 50 alibis. Why right. people love them and they're because they create them, you know, and it's so beautiful that there is no one left to blame. This is your life. This is what you're making it. And the, the simplicity, the beauty of Napoleon Hill's work is just uh, is that to me. It is that there is nobody left to blame. So when you're, you know, if I have a friend who has an issue, I'd at times I find it difficult listening to that conversation where they are blaming people, if that makes sense. I'm trying to not allow that into my space as much as possible, but um, boy, come with me, come with me, come on a ride <laughs> with me, you know? Let's go look at this stuff and let's see. I've seen people light up from this, you know? I, I was right. working with this girl and she had you know, the ex, the ex-husband wasn't paying support. She had kids. She didn't know where she was going to work. She didn't know anything about money. I, I, I had to stop her. I said, whoa, hold on a second here. I had to find one thing that was important for her. And it got down to health. Something we could do something with, Tom. You know what I mean? Here's what we can do. How, what do you want to weigh? When do you want to weigh it by? What are you willing to give for it? You know, right. something right. as simple as that. So she starts walking the next day. She starts walking. And I just saw her on, uh, it was on Sunday night. I just saw her on Sunday night and she's this beautiful light bulb. She's like this lit up light bulb who had nowhere to turn when we first started, when we first got together. But she is this amazing spark, like just based on the beauty of Napoleon Hill's work. Right. And yeah. personal responsibility. Yes. Do you have a speaker Absolutely. on? Do I? Yeah. Do I have a speaker on? What what was that? Seems to be echoing. No, okay. Oh, okay. Right. But personal, personal responsibility is something I don't see in young people as much as you you know, in the old days everybody knew it is take responsibility for your actions and and your life but it, it doesn't seem to be the case so much in this day and age and until you can take 100 percent responsibility for your own personal life no matter what happens to it things beyond what you can control but still it's your responsibility to take whatever happens and make the best out of the current situation right Absolutely. And, you know, now after now that I'm into the law of success and we're talking about atoms and electrons and those things, uh, my question, I start to question, well, wait a minute. Isn't all of it actually under my control? Mm. You know, it's it's a pretty intense subject. It's pretty deep because. Uh, 
I mean, that is the, I don't even want to touch this because I'm not yeah. schooled up on it, but I am so excited to start looking into that. So it, 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 it's uh, pretty powerful when you think about the, and it's 60,000 decisions we get to make every day. That's a lot of decision making that goes on in your subconscious mind, uh, regardless if you pick a positive topic or focus or a negative one. You're making 60,000 decisions a day about what are you going to focus your thoughts on. And if we can grasp that and be aware of as many of those 60,000 as possible, uh, we are headed towards making some positive changes in life because we're recognizing thought by thought where we could be going wrong and redirecting our thinking and even if you just learn that the other 17 principles would follow naturally mm. yes yes absolutely totally agree and i i love when you talk about how many thoughts are going on in your mind i love the file cabinet analogy that, that yes, Nicole yes. uses because Let's say you go into a restaurant and you have to wait in line. Okay. Let's say, let's say you're just stuck behind a couple people and you're in a hurry. Okay. Whatever thought is at the top of your mind, most easily accessible is going to be how you react to that situation. If it is based in love and peace and joy and happiness and whatever, if you flooded your mind with that, so that is at the top of it, chances are, having to wait a couple minutes to get whatever it is you're getting isn't going to affect you at all. But if, right. it's, if it's not attended to, you know what I mean? If those 60,000 thoughts haven't been attended to, then the reactionary thought is going to be the first thing you grab for, which is, you know, panic, fear, you're going to be late, whatever it might be. Right. That's Anger, easily impatient. Sure. You're hitting, me, you're hitting me in a hard topic and one that I had to really address my uh, with myself. Uh, uh, so now what I think is it could be my pastor or it could be my grandmother or it could be, uh, well, my grandmother's are passed away, but let's say it could be my pastor, it could be my mother, or it could be my mother-in-law who's in that car ahead of me uh, yes. or someone or someone who's handicapped. Uh, so I have to think, okay, like, would I get angry at my pastor for not hitting the gas as hard as he could right at the green light? Uh, I hope I wouldn't. So it helps me now to when I am, because I drive a sports car, I like to drive fast. And so sometimes when I think people are not following my commands, you know, I need to think, okay, this could be a pastor or a member from church, somebody I know very well, maybe an old person. Uh, I would feel pretty bad thinking in my head what I might be thinking in my head. And and that's a choice. Remember, there's we're talking about choosing our thoughts. So I had to think, okay, what thoughts am I going to choose instead of hurry up, hurry up, drive faster? I'm going to choose. Okay, hey, could be my pastor. Praise God, nice to see you, pastor. Uh, could be my mother. Oh, okay, mom, take your time. I'm right behind you here. It really does calm you down if you pre-choose the focus of the thought on the areas that tweak you a little bit more than other areas and yeah. driving driving and traffic is one of those ones for me so i yeah. uh, that's what i used to be like okay you know cool it cool it as you said and i'm gonna get there two minutes later um and you won't have insulted your pastor or your mother or your mother-in-law or somebody important to you Yes. And that really helps. Or uh, in my case with my handicap, I'll you know often think of could be someone you know a severe handicap or you know having a hard time. And when you look at it that way, your emotions react a lot differently than when you think this person is purposely slowing me up. Mm. People think I'm nuts. I go to the gym first thing in the morning and then usually in the afternoon sometime. And typically I'm just spending, you know, 15 minutes on the elliptical, 10 minutes on the Stairmaster, work up a good sweat and I'm done. Right. Right. But that time is so, so valuable for my mind. That is why I love it. I just go in there and sometimes I shut down and I just shut down to, uh, 
to no, I do a lot of audio with Napoleon Hill and I shut down to that. And sometimes I shut down to Led Zeppelin, you know what I mean? But yeah, yeah. the time that I spend in there and the time that I'm able to just, um, uh, just think love, you know, think love. Sometimes I'll think when I'm, do, when I'm playing with Zeppelin, sometimes I think I'm on a stage. What, what is it? What does it take to be on that stage and be, you know, I went and saw the Stones here recently and Jagger comes out, 60,000 people all by himself walking down this stage. What is that, Tom? What is yeah. that thing? You know what I mean? What is that thing he has to eliminate any fear from that and just be that human being? You know what I mean? And so and I'll throw use, that one on. Go ahead. You use a positive attitude and definite purpose to get into another concert, too. That Cisco one, didn't you? I absolutely did. We made it in. I was right next to Stephen Tyler of Aerosmith as well. So, yeah, definite purpose is huge in my life. I, I got a great yeah. example of that. Uh, we have to talk have about to it. Talk about if we do a whole radio <laughs> show about Napoleon Hill and don't talk about definite <laughs> as a purpose, we should be kicked off of uh, any talks about Napoleon Hill. So definiteness of purpose. Michael, I believe the one I have is if, is if Jesus were sitting on the other side of my desk, and probably you at times, uh, I think he would give me the exact same document I've written down. Tom, here's why you're here. Here's why you're here. Get to it. And I really believe it. But the first time I went through the Napoleon Hill Leader Certification course, uh, it's part of you know, the first time. When I went through it, you have to write out your definite purpose over a period of time and think about it. And I wrote it, and Judy Williamson said, Tom, um, that's not your definite purpose. You're trying to be Shane Moran from Organo Gold. And God put you on a different path and a different purpose. And... Uh, then it was like, wow, that is crazy. And then I thought, of my purpose is to encourage and inspire people to live positively. But like talking about my arthritis is annoying to me. <laughs> I already have it. I don't need to be talking about it. It brings back memories and pains and irritations and tests and things I didn't want to go through. But when you look at what you've suffered and the adversity and, you know, whenever anybody speaks to encourage other people, the feedback you get is like, okay, this was worth dropping my guard and sharing my pains and adversities and challenges because someone for at least a few days or maybe a long time is going to be able to live more positively through whatever challenge-specific one that they have. And... You know, there's a million and eighty-two different challenges out there. So, if I can help someone just be positive through that challenge for a few more days, a week, months, forever, that's worth whatever pain I've gone through. I'll trade that any time. And uh, you know, there's a there's advantages to being handicapped. You get handicap parking, and you know, all the nice things like that. Everybody's wishing they had my spot. Now, i got to mention that my wife doesn't like me saying handicap. She has a term. It's called handicapable. And mm -hmm. I'm pretty stubborn, actually, about handicap. I remember at an airport once, uh, there was two doors uh, to go through and to get into maybe security, I think, or the baggage. And the woman that side said, okay, go through that door. And she happened to point at the one with the handicap on it. Uh, sign on it. it was a bit wider I guess maybe for wheelchairs and but both lines went to the same place and I was like I'm not going through that door nice. and I said my wife's not handicapped <laughs> and the woman was like oh well I was just pointing in general she said it both doors go to the same place I was like okay so I walked around I went through the other one the non-handicapped door like no way I'm going through that <laughs> And so, and when we park in handicaps, sometimes it's beneficial. I tell uh, Kim, you know, limp a little bit so they know that one of us is handicapped. Mm. And, <laughs> but talk about definiteness of purpose, because when you know that you know that's your purpose and what you've gone through is part of that purpose, man, there is some powerful focus in that. It helps you, it helps you take your focus off of a lot of crap. 
that won't help you. Mm, it's such a powerful thing. Such a powerful thing. First, to touch on your story, it reminded me of Napoleon Hill not allowing his child to learn the sign language. He did not allow his child to learn right. the sign language. You remember this, Tom? Of course. Right, right. Yes, yes. Your story reminded me of that. It's like, well, because, I mean, those labels, those labels that we put on ourselves and other people's put, put on it, other people put on us, you know, there are in depression, Tom, what is depression? You know what I mean? How does somebody shake? How does somebody go to the doctor's office, get by this respected doctor, get labeled as depressed and ever shake that tag? You know, mm -hmm. think of that for a second, you know, I and mean, whether they right. are, they, it's, it's not, it's real. It's not, it's, you know, I'm not to say, but I know that I know this, the label is real. Right. And I've had depression. You can't suffer 24 seven pain in numerous spots in your body for so many years without having periods of depression. But it's like you said, you don't want to take that tag and live with it. You want to understand that there are strategies that you can use, thoughts, words, and actions that will get you out of it uh, and try those first. And they work. And depression is real. And I've gone through it. Probably you have, periods. But And here again, two of the most positive people you meet talking about having gone through that. But we're real people. And uh, when you know that, okay, positive attitude, pleasing person, and all the different principles and that you need to do certain things, uh, that's a lot nicer thought that, you know, this is short term. It's like, okay, my knee could hurt really bad for six weeks and then it's going to go away. I know that because I've gone through the various things like that. So now you're like, okay, I recognize I'm in it. I know how to get out of it, direct my thoughts. And so, yeah. Uh, PMA and then the success principles that help me and I imagine others uh, with periods of depression, right? Sure. Well, get out, get out of again, it. yeah, absolutely. And again, is it? Uh, I mean, call it what it's call it what it. Again, my my conversation is basically about the labeling of the labeling of. I mean, right, let's, right, let's, right, let's right. forget forget depression because I don't want to touch a sensitive subject. But let's right. use lazy, okay? Somebody right. tells you you're lazy, all of a sudden you're lazy. Somebody, it's like the criminal. It's like the criminal in crime in in uh, in the book, you know, in, in Think and Grow Rich. Right. You know, the criminal comes into crime the first time, he abhors it, right? He can't stand it. What is going on, right? right. So somebody tells you you're lazy once, you know, then all of a sudden you start telling yourself you're lazy, all of a sudden you're lazy. You know right. what I mean? So my thing right. is like the labeling of it regardless right. of what it is it's like no 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 you are yeah. what you tell yourself you are you it's know? like auto suggestion absolute auto suggestion auto happens in the negative as well as the positive absolute and that's how most people end up where that's how i ended up where i was you know what i mean i told you i got teased once all of a sudden i'm different i'm different i'm different i need you and know, i've heard i feel bad i'm different right, right. And now I got to find somebody who doesn't make me feel different anymore. And that ruined my high school years, you know? <laughs> right. Um, right. So, yeah, as far as definiteness of purpose, well, obviously, hopefully, hopefully, my passion for sharing the message, Napoleon Hill's message comes through on this, on this <laughs> interview here, on this radio show here. And I, I'm pretty sure it does. It's already yeah. not to. But that is definitely one of my... Um, uh, goes into my definiteness of purpose. And this is an interesting topic for me because my statement is, my statement is, uh, you know, I have a certain amount of money that I want to make by a certain date. And I have, uh, you know, I want specific relationships. I want to help people. I want to inspire people. And there's many different things to it. But you know where definiteness of purpose has shown up? It's an elusive thing to um, it's an elusive thing for me when you are so absolute with this, so absolute with definiteness of purpose to me anyways, I meaning I have not mastered this 
to the extent that I've seen visions and, and events in my life play out where it was so easy, so unbelievably, how did I end up here kind of situations play out in my life, Aerosmith being one of them. Uh, you know, being on the stage next to Steven Tyler at a con at a concert that I should not have been allowed to get into. Right. Right. With the ease and the and the just flow that goes along when you are so crystal clear that this is going to happen. Oh, God. Oh, you, you <laughs> it see was what a I mean? great example. It was, it was like a one or two day example. You put it out there on Facebook. Can anyone uh, help me get into this concert? And as you said, private venue, private concert. Right. How else going to get in? But positive thinking, definite purpose, applied faith, and whatever you want to call it, you are in the concert. And so easy. That's the thing. How, what is that, Tom? That's what I'm continuing. That is why I continue. And I do. I absolutely consider myself an infant in the study of these principles, an absolute infant. What I do say about it is that I know of them. And I think back to when my dad used to tell me, hey, you could be a pro ball player. You know, they talk about you're the master of your fate, the captain of your soul. And that's what my dad was saying. Yeah, you can do whatever it is that you want. But he didn't tell me what it took. He didn't tell me you're the master of your fate and the captain of your soul because you have the ability to control how you think. And that ability to control how you think is just that was the light bulb for me that just kind of changed my whole destination, you know, and my whole focus on life. And so, you know, some people think I'm nuts, you know, obviously, because they're right. steep, they're steeped in there, you know, no, that's all, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I it's remember. All, it's not what we're thinking of. I, I remember the first Bible study I went to, and uh, I asked the pastor who was leading it, I said, huh, you read this book almost every day for all those years? I said, like, don't you know it by now? I was like, don't, isn't it like ingrained in you? And he just kind of looked at me, chuckled, and you know, anyone who reads the Bible knows you get there are verses that appear one year that aren't there the next year. There are situations that hit you harder than the ones the year before. And the same with Think and Grow Rich. Why would people reread it? Dave Lininger, founder of Remax, like 35 times, 40 times. Uh, because it's a continuous study. It's a daily study. We've got 60,000 thoughts a day. Uh, this is part of how we're going to train them is follow these principles, read them, ingrain them, make it a part of your life. And so, yeah, it's an ongoing, we're all students. Oh, we may study it more than the average Joe, you and I, but we're still students. Tomorrow's another chance to pass another exam and, you know, examine our use of the 17 principles. And uh, that's a really encouraging part because, no matter where you are, you recovered from being a drug addict. And people have recovered from amazingly destructive, negative situations in life, thought by thought, day by day, proper decision by proper decision. Um, and, you know, if, if, if you can apply those principles no matter where you are in life, at any time in life and throughout your life, you're going to be on a more positive, focused and directed path than leaving your thoughts and your reading and your knowledge to random sources. Mm. Which is, I mean, ultimately, let's, let's, that in itself, can you can label as true success. If you don't have to suffer with anger, with fear, with jealousy, with rage, with, you know, with any of the stuff that you have absolute control over, whether you allow it or not, if you don't have to suffer with that, is that not ultimate success for a lifetime? Mm. Regardless of what financial, what, what you acquire mm -hmm. financially, you know? Preach it, boy, preach it, exactly. You can have peace of mind and joy and purpose and focus uh, at any time. Uh, you, uh, it's totally up to you, and this is exciting news for people, so...
Uh, oh man, you got me all excited here. <laughs> so talk about life today. You uh, were in a bad situation in part of your life and now uh, you're coaching clients, you're playing baseball, you go to all these cool concerts. Uh, I get tired just watching your Facebook feed. You're doing so many things. Ha. Well, I am very lucky. I'm very... Um... I would say I don't need a lot to make me happy. So I like doing things that are simple and easy and, you know, and, and fun. I like having fun. And that's what, Man. And I mean, gosh, I sell, I sell houses. Uh, I, in fact, I just closed one yesterday and I get to go over. I went, it was over yesterday morning. I was handing off keys to a young couple. Um, so honored, so honored to be dropped into their life. You know, I love what I do in real estate because it's like there's this whole world of like fear and indecision and everything going on. I get to just be the stabilizing force in that and help them kind of, uh, you know, traverse the path of ending up as a homeowner or a home seller, whatever it is that they need mm -hmm. done. And then all of a sudden, you know, I dropped into their life and then all of a sudden they get their house and it's kind of like the relationship kind of flows away a little bit. I still stay in contact, but, um, mm -hmm. but that's my job, Tom. Think of that. <laughs> that's yeah, my job, yeah. you know, oh, who could, we should all be so lucky. You know, we should all be so lucky. And I love, I have a passion, I've been a baseball player since I was a kid, you know. So about 10 years ago, I picked up a ball again and found a team of guys that during the season I go out with on Sunday and I play baseball with them. And I love that too. I mean, I get to stand on the mound and throw a ball 60 feet, six inches to a strike zone. I'm going to try not to get the, the thinking and the whole thing that goes on with pitching. I'm a lefty too. So I'm, you know, there's a little too much going on probably most of the time when I'm on the mound, but uh, the competition that goes into that, you know, even though we're old, it's still, I love to be competitive, you know, right, right. Right. And, uh, keeps you young. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, you know, ultimately to see, like I talked about Avi, my friend Avi, who I coach people and she lit up like, and I just saw her yesterday. And, you know, she actually, I saw her with her ex-husband and he was all lit up too. So something she has done that I played a little part in and given, given a piece to her to kind of light the bulb in her has kind of changed the whole thing that's going on there with her family. And then who knows where it ultimately ends up, but, but to be able to touch a human being like that is, is again, you know, sell a couple houses here and there, make some money, but what is true success, you know, and that the value that comes from knowing I played a little part, see, that's it. You know, in real estate, I play a little part. These kids, you know, if they have kids, they're going to be raised in this home. And Avi, if that ever, whatever happens with that situation, she is different. She is different than when before when I met her. She has more information about the power that's contained between her ears and in her thoughts, you know? And, oh my gosh. I'm just so fortunate, so grateful. And look at, I get to sit here and talk to Tom Cunningham. <laughs> you, and by the way, I, I don't know if I said this or not, you said you didn't like to talk about your arthritis, but I'll tell you what, more than once you have inspired me and kept me going. So know that, Tom, know that. When I, when I feel and those things like you were talking about, before the show, we said, okay, let's try and do 30, 35 minutes. We're like 49 minutes in, and we could be talking another seven days and still be full of energy and excitement. Now, to, for people to reach you, like I know you have, you have an impressive Facebook group, Think and Grow Rich uh, Study Group. Is that what it's called? Absolutely. I have, uh, I'm not exactly sure if it's called San Diego or not, but that, that I'm getting ready to do another book study with people, uh, with people coming up. So they can get a hold of me through email at mm -hmm. uh, mike333 Mike three 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 at cox.net or if they want to talk to me directly if they 
I don't do a lot of coaching, but if somebody wants to be coached, I'm happy to do it. But I'm happy to have conversations, too, about Napoleon Hill. And that is 619-417-1954. And I'm not, you know, doing that to promote anything other than the beauty that is this conversation, you know? Well, let me do the promoting. If you live in San Diego and you're buying or selling a house, you better buy, uh, do it through Michael. Like, uh, you see that definite of purpose? He's going to have that house sold before you sign the agreement, even. Yes, so, thank you. Know, make sure you give Michael a call. You will be impressed. And uh, the attitude is infectious. I know it. <laughs> we can feel it here. So uh, thanks so much uh, for your time today, Michael. Amazing. People, check People out check that Think and Grow Rich study group. Uh, uh, email them. Very accessible. Uh, this was a fun conversation, Michael. Thank you so, so much. Uh, it's a privilege to be on with you, Tom. Privilege. Absolutely, Absolutely a privilege to be on with you. Have an amazing day. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of Journey to Success Radio. If you or anyone you know would like to be interviewed for the show, email tom at tomtutall.com for details.